Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our second seminar in our Genomic Innovator Series here at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Our vision for this series is pairing an early career researcher funded under NHGRI's Genomic Innovator Award Program with a more senior researcher whose work relates to the research area. And we believe that this pairing will give us insight into the creative endeavors that are accelerating work at the forefront of genomics. And I'm really excited about today because I think both of these speakers have taken that assignment seriously, and I'm really excited to see what they've done. So my name is Chris Gunter. I'm the NHGRI Senior Advisor to the Director for Genomics Engagement, and I'll be moderating the introductions today. And then my colleague, Lisa Chadwick, who is a wonderful program director in our Division of Genome Sciences, will moderate the Q&A portion of our seminar after our two speakers. So please feel free to put your questions questions into the Q&A button via Zoom at any point in the seminar, and then at the end, Lisa will lead us through them. So now that we have the mechanics down, I am very pleased to introduce our two speakers for today's topic, which is data-driven approaches to define rare genetic diseases. They're going to alternate speaking, but Dr. Melissa, Melissa <laughs> too, talking too fast, Melissa Handel will start us off. She is the Chief Research Informatics Officer and Marsico Endowed Chair in Data Science at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. She's also the Director for the Center of Data to Health and the Principal Investigator of the National COVID, COVID Cohort Collaborative, N3C is what that's called. Her vision is to weave together healthcare systems, basic science research, and patient-generated data through development of data integration technologies and innovative data capture strategies. And then our second speaker, again, they're gonna alternate, who was the recipient of our Genomic Innovator Award is Dr. Jessica Chong. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And she's also co-investigator in the Genomics Research to Elucidate the Genetics of Rare Diseases Consortium, or GREGOR for short. That's a shout out to all the genetics nerds out there. In addition, she is highly committed to encouraging opening open data sharing in science and especially in rare disease genetics. So I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa to start us off. Thanks very much. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Chong is going to share the slides. And first, I'd just like to, to thank um, uh, Chris and Lisa and the whole team uh, for putting uh, Dr. Chong and myself together. We had an absolutely wonderful time um, with this idea of partnering a more senior investigator with one of the Genomic Innovator Awardees. And so we're really pleased to present this shared presentation to you all today. Um, these slides will be available um, at the bit.ly as well as the recording uh, on the NHGRI NHGR, website. Um, and if you want to tweet about us, uh, we'd love to, to see what you think. Um, next slide, please. So I just like to start with um, kind of thinking about how we define diseases. And this is really important from a conceptual perspective in order that we may develop computational approaches for diagnostic, for prognosis, and for treatment uh, discovery and selection. So if we think about um, a disease state, every person fundamentally is an N of one disease. This is really the promise of what we mean by precision medicine. We are the um, collective um, uh, uh, outcomes of our genetic endowment and our environmental influences over time, with the phenotypic outcomes being the readout of that over time. And so the question, you know, really about how we define diseases, given this sort of notion of every person having their own end of one disease state, um, is what are the most meaningful groupings of patients? And by and what I mean by that is what are the meaningful groupings of patients that we can use for those same uh, effective um, functions? So for diagnosing patients, for, for um, developing prognostic tools, and for mechanism discovery and treatment um, selection. So um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is really about how do we think about this in the context of rare diseases, and in particular Mendelian diseases, which are not the same thing, um, and, and really taking a computational approach to defining diseases. Next slide, please. So um, approximately one in 10 Americans or 400 million um, uh, people globally are afflicted with a rare disease. This does not mean that all rare diseases are necessarily um, life-threatening, um, but they all um, are debilitating in, in one way or another. And each, uh, it's, um, the zebra is often used as a symbol for um, 
uh, for rare diseases because each patient's characteristics are akin to the variation in zebra stripes. And so uh, it's often said that clinicians refer to the patient sitting in front of them that may have a rare disease as I have, I have a zebra. Um, but uh, this is really um, uh, potentially, um, uh, uh, I think, misleading because if one in 10 Americans actually have a have a rare diseases, then we should be thinking about horses and not zebras, right? So the, the fact is that rare diseases collectively are quite common. And so that's really kind of um, a different perspective that allows us to develop more holistic approaches uh, to defining disease and to the diagnostics and mechanism discovery. Um, the other thing that I would say is that back in 1983, as part of the Orphan Drug Act, um, it was declared that I believe it was 7,500 rare diseases. And this number has been quoted since 1983. Well, we fundamentally know, um, especially with many thanks to NHGRI for funding um, Gregor and, and uh, a whole variety of um, disease gene discovery uh, initiatives, that this number is demonstrably wrong. Uh, we, we find new rare diseases every day or every week. Um, OMIM is constantly updating records. Um, and so we really need to think about you know, what that number really means in that context. And it really does a disservice to the patients with rare diseases um, to have that number um, never changing. Um, and so uh, there's an article that was written in collaboration with NLM, um, the case for open science uh, rare diseases. So I'd, I'd urge folks to, to read that. It really focuses on how do we as a global community um, share data and create open science initiatives that allow us to understand um, you know, who are the patients with rare diseases and how can we um, leverage each other's work uh, to better diagnose them and better care for them. Next slide. So well, why is the number wrong? So as I already mentioned, um, uh, the uh, criteria for rare around the world varies. Um, uh, from the Orphan Drug Act, the rare disease affects fewer than 200,000 people in the United States. In 2000, the European Union considered a disease to be rare when it affects fewer than one in 2,000 people. Um, and also just to note that, as I mentioned, rare disease, just because it's a rare disease does not mean that it's a Mendelian or even a genetic disease. And so we have worked hard to try to reveal um, environmental causes of rare diseases, for example, as well as um, Mendelian ones or genetic ones. Um, so new diseases are discovered all the time, but the number is never updated, as I mentioned. Um, and the other thing I, I really also want to highlight is that there's there are for as many patients as get diagnosed with the rare disease, there are just as many patients who don't. And so those patients are all those N of ones unmatched um, and you know get um, sort of logged, hopefully if they're lucky in systems such as the matchmaker exchange, where we can find um, the second patient potentially in the world, which would um, significantly aid diagnosis for that patient. So um, those those are all rare diseases as well, and and they're you know essentially never counted. There are also different um, disease definitions around the world for rare diseases. So there are dozens of terminology and disease registries. These, um, these terminologies are not uh, often included in clinical terminologies, such as the International Classification of Diseases, which are commonly used in electronic health records. And fundamentally, the definition of a rare disease and how to model it computationally has remained more of an art than a science. Next slide, please. So, the prevailing clinical diagnostic pipelines tend to leverage only a tiny fraction of the data. So if you think about a patient um, or a family that comes into a clinical genetics clinic, um, they might have a whole exome or a whole genome ordered, um, and that would be compared to in a variety of different pipelines to a genomic reference um, sequence. Um, if you hit the forward button, please. But these data types that are really characteristics, remember our, our N of one patient is, a, um, is the culmination of their genetic endowment and their environmental influences over time with the phenotypic characteristics as the readout. Well, there's a lot of clinical phenotype information, multi-omics phenotype information, socioeconomic factors, um, environmental factors that um, are not uh, generally leveraged in the diagnostic context, and the resources for references for those individual elements about the patient are also not very robust. So um, how do we define diseases leveraging phenotypic characteriz characterizations? How do we correlate this with population frequency? Um, a rare disease um, such as sickle cell anemia might be rare in the United States, but it can be quite common in regions of Africa. 
So these kinds of disease definitions and, and incidents matter. Um, how do we um, perform population-based statistics and disease risk factors um, and understand how do we surveil for rare diseases, uh, rare disease patients in general? So there's a lot of data, both at a personal level as well as a, a reference level that is simply underutilized in the diagnostic um, context of a rare disease patient. Next slide. So the challenges start with the basics, phenotyping. So um, unfortunately, um, computational phenotyping, uh, you know, is has um, is a is a still emergent area of research in computational biology and clinical informatics. A lot of what we do in the electronic health record still looks a lot like this um, uh, lovely old um, uh, clinical note. Um, and you can see <laughs> things like always examine ears and scarlet fever. Um, the clinical notes remain uh, a place where a lot of clinicians will create phenotypic information that is not already or otherwise um, easily recorded in the electronic health record. So, so we really have to think about how do we improve the electronic health record environment to support the documentation of the patient's characteristics um, as a biological subject, um, in addition to the other uses that an electronic health record serves. Next slide. So the human phenotype ontology is an ontology um, developed by the Monarch Initiative and led by Dr. Peter Robinson. And it's a, it's, a, it's a clinical terminology, but it differs from standard terminology, such as the International Classification of Diseases, in the sense that it is a um, logical graph. Um, and it has, consists of about um, 14,500 terms or so. Um, and terms are represented as nodes in that graph, such as hyposmia or deeply set eyes. Um, these uh, uh, phenotypic features that are captured in this, this graph structure are associated. Um, we have around 190,000 associations of these terms to, um, to disease entities. So um, really, and I'll get into this in a little bit, really characterizing diseases as a representation of their phenotypic features that are that come from this, this ontology graph. One of the really most important um, features of the human phenotype ontology, or HPO for short, is that it's also integrated with a variety of other data sources and other terminologies, such as the gene ontology. So here, for example, we have the term hyposmia, which is represented logically as the abnormality of a sensory perception of smell or the absence of a sensory perception of smell, which at the time of this query um, happened to also have uh, 34,000 annotations and 22 species. So the way in which this logic um, sort of undergirds this ontology connects to basic research data in a way that clinical terminologies, uh, standard clinical terminologies really do not, allows us to do much, um, uh, much more computational assessments and integration of data to hopefully reveal mechanisms uh, of disease. Uh, next slide. So this is how um, the, the HPO is used in action. So um, here we have curated as part of Monarch Initiative the Weidemann-Steiner syndrome disease entity. Um, this is the blue um, uh, and, uh, phenotype terms in the middle. And so you can see, and this is just a, a subset of the list of terms that are associated with Weidemann-Steiner. Um, and you can see terms such as short toe, short middle phalanx of the finger, delayed speech and language development, intellectual disability, microcephaly, um, thin upper lip vermilion. And these are all features uh, that you really, you wouldn't see necessarily, they're biological features uh, um, of a patient's characteristics, but they're not managed conditions for the most part. And therefore they're not necessarily Lar largely found in the International Classification of Diseases or any part of the EHR. We, we simply don't, um, you know, uh, bill for sh having short toes, for example. So, so by characterizing the patient as a biological subject, that allows us to compare those phenotypic features um, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with patients and known gold standards as well as across species. And we're not going to talk about the cross species part today, but suffice it to say that it's um, a relevant um, component of how we um, build our diagnostic tools. So here uh, we can see that these two patients um, came into uh, my colleague's clinic within a few weeks of each other. One was a three-year-old girl in green on the left and a 14-year-old boy on the right. And the features are non exactly matching to our gold standard um, disease definition of these phenotypic features. So, for example, the three year old girl had cone shaped epiphysis of the phalanges of the hand, and a human would be able to tell that that's 
related to the short middle phalanx of the finger. Um, but what we want to do is have the computer tell us that. And the computer can calculate the degree of similarity between those two terms. We don't see that term uh, as represented for our 14-year-old boy. And in fact, we even see terms that are the opposite of the standard profile, so long toes versus short toes. And so the algorithm takes into account the overall similarity of the set of features for each individual patient compared to our whole corpus of more than 7,000 disease, uh, gold standard disease uh, annotation profiles. So if you click the next button, please, you can see um, this is basically what we're trying to get after in, in building these computational tools is for diagnostics to work like this, the reference knowledge for this information needs to be systematically queryable. And this is really where it's really exciting to see Dr. Chong's work because that's in fact um, one of the major um, uh, um, contributions that will be useful to us uh, in our diagnostic tools, um, as well as um, our work with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which I'll talk about at the end, to build standards for individual phenotypic um, characterizations. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick overview of the diagnostic tool um, Eximizer that's led by Dr. Damian Smedley. Um, uh, in the UK. And uh, essentially, our patient comes in, as I mentioned, they uh, standard practice is to get a whole genome sequence or whole exome sequence there in the middle. Um, what we have added here is the HPO annotations, as I mentioned, and also that cross-species um, comparisons to disease reference as well as protein-protein interactions. Uh, to make a very long story short, we essentially leverage standard um, uh, genomics methods to remove off-target variants and common variants and benign variants, et cetera. Um, but then com really combining that with this phenotypic similarity that I had showed on the prior slide to come up with a prioritized list um, uh, of variants that's much shorter, uh, hopefully, um, than one uh, that you would get with just using the genomic side. And we've had uh, great success uh, in leveraging uh, the Eximizer tool in the Genomics England project uh, and in a variety of other settings, and it's open source and available to anyone who wants to incorporate it into their pipelines. Next slide. So what is the most clinically useful way to define and group diseases? So one of our challenges that we came across in doing this work and developing Eximizer and the phenotype similarity tools is that we, we had a lot of different disease entities um, uh, from across the world and different in different databases and different registries. So these different um, disease uh, concepts span multiple categories, and we needed a systematic way of relating them all so that we could have, you know, kind of a, a unified Weidemann Steiner syndrome, um, for example, um, entity that would collate the information coming from different sources that might have a Weidemann Steiner um, entry. But there are many terminologies and ontologies and lists, as well as many, many mappings between them. These are both a good thing and a bad thing. They can be used to crosswalk. But the problem is those mappings between all these different terminologies, and I'm sure there's almost no one in our audience today that hasn't, for example, uh, map, mapped OMIM to Orphanet or vice versa, is that the mappings are often mutually inconsistent. There's N squared minus N set of mappings, and there we, we often in the mappings don't really know what's a one-to-one -one equivalent. Um, and so this makes it very computationally challenging for us to um, leverage, you know, all these different resources as this sort of disease entity handle um, by which we would hang those um, phenotypic profiles, as I showed with Weidemann Steiner syndrome. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of some of the reconciliation that we've done um, uh, and, and, and some of the challenges that we that we face. So here, for example, we have three different sources, Orphanet, um, the National Cancer Institute's thesaurus, and the, the disease ontology, um, where we see, for example, peroxisome biogenesis disorder um, you know, is a subtype of rare hereditary me metabolic disease with peripheral neuropathy, um, whereas uh, in the NCIT, it's a subtype of leukodystrophy. Um, and then, uh, you know, over on the right, we see that um, Zellweger syndrome itself is a, um, a, is a subtype of peroxisomal uh, uh, disease. And so you can see that computationally, if we're going to try to reconcile the knowledge associated or data associated with these entities in these different resources, that we have a really big problem because there are different labels, different parents, different children, different synonyms, different text definitions, um, and different clinical usages even 
And so how do we determine whether or not these entities are equal and clean up the associations between these um, very complex and um, not very well aligned uh, disease resources? Next slide, please. So in comes Mondo, which means for the world, which is an evidence-based curated merger of equivalence disease concepts from all as many different resources as, as, as we have um, uh, that are relevant to um, rare and Mendelian diseases in particular, although as I mentioned, we are um, curating additional um, environmental diseases and other um, infectious diseases as well. Um, some of the sources, there are others, are shown on the left, OMIM, Orphanet, NCIT, GARD um, from NCATS, um, EBI's uh, Experimental Factor Ontology, and, and many others. And essentially, um, an algorithm developed by Dr. Chris Mungle, KBOOM, is the Bayesian Owl Ontology merging algorithm, was used to initially seed the uh, reconciliations, the essentially equ equivalence cliques um, of these different disease entities um, uh, from across different resources. So basically trying to examine, for example, a Zellweger syndrome in OMIM, the same as Zellweger syndrome that's in the NCIT. And we can use a variety of different algorithmic approaches um, to determine that. And then a curator looks at whether or not that grouping um, of equivalent classes from across those different resources are actually truly equivalent. And for the ones that the algorithm cannot understand, uh, we find errors and, and push those back to the individual sources. So for example, we found that in MeSH, there was a set of duplicated disease entities that had both Roman numerals and alphanumeric representation. So for example, um, diabetes type one with the Roman numeral one versus diabetes type one um, with the number one. Um, and so, and uh, so MeSH was able to uh, correct that. And so that helps everybody who's, um, who's using MeSH as well as um, our work within Mondo. Next slide, please. So this is what that looks like with a real example. So um, in the middle, uh, we have um, exact matches here for uh, adult refsum disease. Uh, there's a Mondo identifier, and you can see in the, in the column with all the identifiers that have been determined to be equivalent, um, what the term IDs uh, for those sources are, um, also referencing the full provenance of the synonyms. So if we get synonyms from OMIM or UMLS, those synonyms that are over on the left, we track the provenance of every synonym. So we determine this equivalency through the through Mondo reconciliation process that I mentioned earlier, but then we also provide that provenance for the information coming from each of the individual sources uh, for both um, rigor and reproducibility, but also for attribution. Uh, we also um, look at um, how we have non-equivalent uh, term IDs for cross-references. So for example, here, um, adult refsum disease is really not equivalent to phytanic acid storage disease, but some of the sources contain um, that cross-reference. And so we track that as well. And so this really aids cleaning up of this computational challenge that we have of all these different disease resources, really not agreeing with each other to try to understand what are the equivalencies and what, what is not equivalent and keep track of the provenance uh, over time. Next slide. So uh, in, in order to sort of um, kind of test out this concept, we looked at, you know, how can we update the number of rare diseases? Um, and, you know, it's a fundamental premise that if rare diseases are not counted, that rare disease patients will not count either. And so we just took five commonly utilized sources of rare diseases, the NCIT, the disease ontology, Ecology, GARD, Orphanet, and OMIM, and we looked to see um, how many diseases were in, in one source versus um, multiple sources. And interestingly enough, we found that just five sources, and granted we have many more in, in, in Mondo uh, at this time, we found uh, over 10,000 unique rare disease concepts. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big difference from the original 1983 Orphan Drug Act number of 7,500. But even more interestingly, we found only 333 diseases that were shared in all five of these resources and many, many, many disease entities that were only in one resource. And so what this means is that um, by reconciling this disease knowledge computationally and through clinician and curator assisted um, uh, sort of mediation of the equivalence determinations, we have a much better um, opportunity to create improved diagnostic tools that leverage all of the world's um, disease knowledge uh, in those diagnostic profiles that I showed you for Weiderman-Steiner syndrome, now that we can reconcile the knowledge that is associated with each one of these disease entities. Uh, next slide, please. So, so 
defining diseases is is really the subject of Dr. Um, Chong's work. And so um, just to kind of give you some perspective uh, of why her work is so critically important at this time, um, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an overview of, of just some of the work that we have been um, participating in, um, in collaboration with, with ClinGen and OMIM in particular. Um, and, and what this is about is really how do we define and, and, and uh, name diseases? Um, and we worked really closely with ClinGen for a number of years to uh, on what we called the lumping and splitting group, um, uh, which basically created um, disease uh, um, uh, lumping and splitting guidelines. And if you're a bird watcher, um, you're probably a splitter, so you can have more counts on your uh, <laughs> on your bird list. But for for diseases, it's really really important for diagnostic tools and for mechanism discovery to really think through what does it mean to be um, an individual disease entity. And so, does the does the disease entity um, have a distinct molecular mechanism? Um, that would tend us to lead towards lumping um, those disease entities. Is there a reputable assertion of difference, distinct clinical management, distinct phenotypic profiles? And really, this is all about cure, uh, ClinGen's efforts to curate the gene disease um, associations. Um, and these are, these are essentially yes, no decisions for lumping and splitting. Um, and it's it's a little bit subjective in some cases. Sometimes um, some of the characterizations are in, are in conflict and would lend towards lumping, and some would lend towards splitting. And the curators work very hard to document um, that those decisions uh, and the rationale. This takes a lot of effort. There are an enormous number of people on the ClinGen team that go through this process um, with great detail, so that the, our diagnostic tools can be accurate. And we have enormous gratitude to them for doing that. That has really provided a lot of fodder for the kind of work that Dr. Chong um, is going to present next, and and really just wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, one of our biggest challenges again is that um, different diseases are, diseases are defined in different ways by different groups with different attributes. So we have this 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 shared work going on in collaboration with ClinGen and OMIM, but there's also all of the many other resources that are similarly curating different components of disease gene associations. Um, you know, we have ClinVar, we have the GeneWAS catalog, we have the comparative toxicogenomics database, um, and there are many others. And so fundamentally, we need computational methods to predict um, what are new Mendelian um, disease gene associations as you can have more than one disease per gene and more than one gene per disease. Uh, and so we, in order to do that, we really need both case level phenotypic data and high throughput gene disease association discovery. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Chong to tell you about her work in this area. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna hop right into it. Um, so, because as Melissa said, these disease entities are divide, defined in different ways and different groups use different criteria to assess gene disease validity. So that is when a gene is established to an underlying um, a Mendelian condition, no one really agrees on how many Mendelian conditions are known to exist, let alone how many genes are currently known to underlie Mendelian conditions. Um, and you would think that it should be easy to count genes and it's, it's actually not. Um, so this range and count means that we have a very incomplete understanding of the genomic landscape of Mendelian conditions. And we think this is a problem because studying Mendelian conditions is really the most straightforward opportunity to understand the relationship between genotype, gene, and phenotype. Um, and that's just simply because, you know, for the vast majority of affected individuals, once you find the causal genotype, you've necessarily implicated the target locus. locus. You don't have to do fine mapping, for example. And each discovery of a new Mendelian gene disease relationship reveals variant effects, as well as um, the effects of gene disruption on human phenotype. So moreover, this wide variation in counts makes it harder to study whether, whether there are systematic relationships between genic or genomic properties and whether a gene underlies a Mendelian condition. Um, and we particularly do not yet understand the latter relationship of how pertur perturbation of the genome governs that variation in the nature of Mendelian conditions. So the summary is that we're better at identifying pathogenic variants than predicting their phenotypic effects. And the end result is that even after we find a causal variant, uh, clinical diagnosis and health implications for an infected individual can remain unclear. 
So, you know, nevertheless, uh, you know, even with these flaws, it's obviously, you know, there's lots of people who are trying to work on improving our systems. Um, can we still use the data that's available right now to predict how many genes will eventually be shown to underlie a Mendelian condition, um, which I'll, some, I'll just say MC just for um, short sometimes, um, and, and identify which features, the genomic features are most predictive. Um, and so to do that, you actually need to separate the known genes that are already known to underlie a Mendelian condition, um, the genes that are that underlie a not yet known Mendelian condition, we'll call them future gene discoveries, um, and genes that will never, never say never, but never underlie a Mendelian condition. And that's because even at the current pace of gene discovery, which is being shown here um, in red, um, as well as the pace of syndrome delineation, um, it, which is uh, the pace of gene discovery has is down from its peak in 2015, um, but the field is still reporting about 150 new gene disease relationships per year for um, Mendelian conditions. Um, and so we don't want to train a model that treats all genes that are not currently known um, to cause a Mendelian condition or uh, to our knowledge at this time as genes that will never be implicated because they're really different. Um, and so when we do this analysis, it's complicated by potential biases and circularity in a lot of different ways, just to kind of give you some idea of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's genes that are uh, already implicated in Mendelian conditions right now uh, tend to be, uh, have a condition, un underlying condition that's more clinically recognizable than, than the genes that are underlying conditions that uh, we haven't yet, uh, or we are currently right now um, delineating or and identifying. Um, we know that there's a bias in the literature, so there are, there's more annotations available for known um, genes, and that's because, you know, obviously once someone's, once we've established that there's a gene disease relationship, that's the, you know, that's the, that's like the ghost start you know, start your engines for all the people who are doing model organism work and um, and all sorts of experimental um, functional experiments um, and then uh, uh, and then finally you know and specifically the genes that are underlying uh, Mendelian conditions are more likely to have a you know mutant like for example, a mutant mouse or a zebrafish um, or even fly or sometimes yeast um, have that generated and phenotype. And so that leads to these more annotations um, as well as a phenotype for the model organism. Um, so we uh, we created a model to do this. We put in a, you know actually a, a sparse number of features, um, but we were looking at both gene level features such as number of protein coding transcripts per gene, number of paralogs and the identity with paralogs. Um, as well as some uh, metrics like population constraint and conservation of genes um, and then protein level metrics like the number and type of domains um, of the of the protein that's encoded by the gene. Uh, and we uh, used something called the autogluon, um, which is a machine learning library that combines many different machine learning techniques into a single ensemble model. Um, and uh, so to feed into this analysis, since I said we have to split have to split our genes, we used as we essentially trained on genes that are known um, to cause or to underlie a Mendelian condition. So that means they meet uh, the Gen CC gene disease relationship criteria of being having definitive, strong, or moderate evidence for a relationship. And then we classified our no never genes, so the genes that may never be, you know, we think will never be shown to underlie a Mendelian condition as all human orthologue genes in MGI that have no abnormal phenotype detected in mice where um, there's been at least one mutant mouse that's been phenotyped. Um, and so these, I, I'm just going to show this in the table here as the known genes are future discoveries, which is what we're interested in, in calculating, and then our never genes. Um, and so in total, we actually, our model ends up predicting that a total of about 17,000 genes will one day be shown to underlie a Mendelian condition. And that's actually 85% of all protein coding genes. Um, and we've only implicated 20% of those genes so far. So we actually have a long way to go um, at the current pace of gene discovery. It's like maybe about hundred more years. Um, and then this 17,000 gene figure is, is actually somewhat of an underestimate um, for a few reasons, including we know that some of those never genes are actually, you know, genes that were only tested as a knockout mouse, and the gene might on, only um, lead to an abnormal phenotype due, due to gain of function, for example. Um, and we also know that sometimes their mouse knockouts are normal, have normal phenotypes, even though a human with the similar variants are, are affected by a Mendelian condition. Um, so I've bolded uh, the features so far. 
um, the, that are most, that have the highest importance. Um, so these are, that's here. Um, and they kind of, if you're sort of in this area, this kind of makes sense to you, right? The number of transcripts, the number of paralogs, um, how long the transcript is, these are all going to, you know, uh, be correlated with whether or not it's like you're likely to underlie a Mendelian condition. Um, and we're actually still working to add new metrics that are unbiased by existing knowledge of known genes. So that's actually really one of the challenges because, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of, once you've established that a gene is um, underlying a Mendelian condition, there's a lot more research that gets done about that gene. And so, uh, and so trying to figure out what metrics are unbiased by that knowledge is, um, is a challenge. Um, but we're hoping that we can use this model to provide both a per gene likelihood um, of of underlying a Mendelian condition, as well as a binary prediction of yes or no. Um, this will we think this will one day be shown to be a Mendelian condition, um, and we have a um, overall AUC of 0.76, which is actually pretty good. Um, so we also plan to um, explore whether we can develop a model that. Uh, does these predictions from first principles, so from genomic properties alone. So right now we're taking advantage of conservation uh, metrics and population con population constraint, but those aren't really properties of the gene or genome itself. Um, and you know we don't. You were obviously this is this is probably like a pie in the sky vision, but you know ideally I'd love to be able to say that we can do this just from looking at the genome and the gene itself. All right, so we can do reasonably well at predicting which genes are likely to one day be implicated in MC, but how well do we currently do at predicting the number of Mendelian conditions caused by pathogenic variants in each gene? Um, Mike Bramshad and I had coined this term phenotropy a while back to describe the phenomenon when one gene underlies multiple distinct Mendelian conditions. And this is a play on pleiotropy, um, which is when you observe that, you know, perturbing a single gene leads to one condition that has multiple um, clinical findings or affected tissues or body systems. Um, so the phenotropy count would be the number of distinct Mendelian conditions due to variants in a gene. Uh, this uh, phenotropy has historically sometimes been referred to as allelic affinity, but we think the term is really confusing and not very specific it's, as it's been used. Um, it's currently being used to describe unrelated phenomenon like binding strength of a transcription factor to different alleles. So qu the question is, can we come up with sort of this genome-wide map or assessment of prediction of the number of um, the, the phenotropy count per gene? Uh, we know that approximately 25% of all known genes reportedly underlie two or more conditions. And so we uh, applied the same modeling approach that we used previously, except now we're trying to predict number of distinct disease entities meeting the Gen CC criteria. Um, and when we do this, we predict a total of approximately 26,000 actually Mendelian conditions with a mean phenotropy count per disease gene of 1.5. And this means, again, that we've only discovered about 20% of all Mendelian conditions that will one day be discovered. So, as uh, you know, once again, as Melissa said, it's not 7,000. They're not 7,000 rare diseases. They are far, far more than that. Um, I've shown the features that have the highest importance for our model here. Uh, but the important takeaway is that our model actually performs pretty badly. The R squared is only 0 0.1. And so why is that? Well, we did pretty well with predicting which genes underlie MCs, but why are we doing so badly at predicting the phenotropy count for those genes? Um, and it's really because there's no objective way to determine right now when the phenotypic distributions overlap uh, be to, uh, for collections of individuals, affected individuals, so as that they represent a single MC versus two or more. Um, so for example, the criteria is used to exert the existence of multiple conditions for a single gene can differ between phenotypic classes. So for example, um, intellectual disability or developmental delay versus um, let's say a skin disorder. Um, and they differ between those phenotypic classes as well as between genes. Um, and this means that current counts of Mendelian conditions are not based on a uniform assessment of phenotropy. So here's just a concrete example of a gene that's been reported to underlie, depending on what database you use, um, and who's reporting between 13 and 20 different Mendelian conditions. Um, and the question is not just is 13 right or is 20 right, but are e these all of these different disorders that are listed, are they actually even really equally distinct from each other, or are some of them actually really the same thing? 
So one of the goals for our ward is to try to um, try a different approach to syndrome delineation or essentially defining what is a Mendelian condition in order to increase the objectivity and precision of this process um, to establish quantitative criteria for distinguishing between um, conditions. And ultimately, we want to uh, hopefully improve our understanding of the distribution of phenotypic effects per genotype and gene. So we are developing this approach for post hoc, so after the gene has been discovered. So it's not for diagnosis and it's not for discovering a gene discovery, but we're doing this post hoc delineation of what we're calling a quantitative Mendelian condition or a QMC. Um, we're using uh, machine learning techniques, um, particularly something called topic modeling, which is sort of the machine learning technique family that is used to analyze like a newspaper and say like, oh, this this paper is mostly about, poli this article is mostly about uh, politics and, you know, 20% about sports. Um, and we're also using techniques from phenomics to calculate um, similarity between phenotypes or um, HPO terms, and this is called semantic similarity. Um, our model uh, is, uh, I think, a little different than other things that have been done because we're using both genotype and phenotype information simultaneously. So our model kind of schematically works like this. We take each individual with a pathogenic variant in a gene of interest. Um, and then we, so that's each individual here, each row, um, and we encode their genotype and their phenotype or their clinical findings in a matrix where each column represents one clinical finding. Um, and then you just have essentially count one if one individual has that clinical finding. Um, and then uh, and then each row represents a unique genotype. And so then if you have multiple individuals who have the same genotype, you can kind of sum up their information and aggregate it across individuals into one row for that genotype. Um, and so then once we've created this ma matrix of one row per genotype and one column per clinical finding, we perform a technique called non-negative matrix factorization or NMF, and that decomposes this matrix into two factors, a genotype by QMC or the quantitative Mendelian condition matrix and a QMC by clinical findings matrix so that each QMC is defined by a set of genotypes and a set of clinical findings. So here's one um, possible outcome of when we, you know, would do this when we would use our model uh, where we would, you have this sort of mixed up matrix of, of genotypes and clinical findings. Uh, and then once you perform NMF, you can actually identify, oh, there's, you know, two different QMCs here. There's no overlap in the genotypes and no overlap in the uh, clinical findings between the two different uh, QMCs. Then here's another example where you might identify two QMCs where the clinical findings do overlap, but there are no overlapping genotypes um, between the uh, QMCs. And then finally, um, an, a one last example where we really can't actually make head or, heads or tails of these two different groups, and we think that there's such significant, the model says that there's such significant overlap between genotypes and clinical findings that we only identify one QMC. Uh, so to develop our model, we used uh, two different sets of cases. We've, we're using cases that have been extracted by manual curation from the literature and individuals, a uh, case set of individuals who received clinical diagnostic testing um, from uh, our collaborators, GeneDx. Uh, to be included, individuals have to have pathogenic variants identified in the gene of interest that we're analyzing, um, and their phenotype must be explained by that variant or variants in that gene. And that gene alone. So there's no additional variants that are considered to be contributing to the phenotype. Um, we know that these kind of literature cases and the clinical cases have different biases um, and challenges. So the literature cases, you know, are obviously been selectively curated and reported by the authors of the papers. <clears throat> and so, you know, we also might be missing contributing variants that were not reported in the paper at all. Um, the clinical findings have uh, the clinical cases have their findings identified by natural language processing from clinic notes or test requisition forms, and so we might end up with completely unrelated findings. Like uh, this person had a fever; uh, they have you know food allergy, um, and so we have to you know, our model has to be able to kind of exclude these um, unrelated uh, findings. And in both cases, we may be just dealing with missing data, um, as well as noise in the choice that someone makes of for which HPO term um, to label uh, a particular, uh, to describe a particular finding. So for example, you know, one person might say something, see, see the same kid and say, this person says they have intellectual disability. Another one might call it neurodevelopmental delay. Um, and another one might give it mild developmental delay. And they all actually mean exactly the same thing. Um, 
Okay. So here's a broad overview of our process and our model for delineation of these QMCs. We do some pre-filtering of the data to exclude HPO terms if the term or the parent terms are only found in a single individual. Um, and we also exclude terms that are too broad to be very informative. Uh, and then we create this that genotype by clinical finding matrix that I mentioned with each finding weighted by the proportion of conditions in the HPO database or HPO ontology um, that are annotated with that clinical finding and the proportion of variance in the data set found in an individual with that clinical finding. Uh, we calculate phenotypic similarity using um, something called the ERIC approach for pairwise semantic similarity. Um, and then we define our QMCs as, as I've mentioned before, the collection of clinical findings and variants that are grouped together. Um, to evaluate our model's performance, we use um, precision and recall metrics um, for both variant level precision recall and clinical finding level recall. And uh, these are summarized by uh, something called F-score. 100 is great, um, it's essentially like 100%. Um, and we manually, right now while we're developing the mod model, we manually label what's considered true or not. Um, and so I'm, we've been testing on both these literature cases and GeneDx cases, um, and I'm just going to show some results from analysis of one gene in the GeneDx set. So uh, one of the first gene discoveries made by exome sequencing in 2010 was that variants in KMT2D cause Kabuki syndrome and some of the diagnostic criteria listed here. Um, and interestingly, in recent years, there's been this putative new syndrome, um, currently unnamed, um, for brevity, I'm just going to call it charge-like, that was reported in individuals who also have pathogenic variants in KMT2D. And these are the most common clinical findings reported so far for this charge-like um, syndrome. So we applied our model to 224 individuals who received testing by GeneDx and had a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant in KMT2D identified. And after quite a few iterations of our model, in which we tried 14 different combinations of approaches for assessing phenotypic similarity and weighting our clinical findings, we were actually able to achieve pretty good performance on this, you know, 90, for, especially for identifying that charge-like syndrome at seven, we're at 70 to 80% almost um, uh, F-score, uh, despite that's relatively the really small number of charge-like cases in the data set. And then here's a word cloud with the most common HPO terms in each of the QMCs that our model identified. And you can really see that some of these, uh, some of those terms that were reported in the literature as being uh, distinctive findings for each of these two respective conditions are the same findings that are coming popping up um, commonly in our word clouds. So we're pretty excited about this. Uh, so we're uh, we have you know quite a lot of work to still do. We're working on uh, ways to test co-occurrence frequencies. Um, we're planning to next expand the model to incorporate variant different variant annotations, and so that essentially like an ontology for variants um, and handle bioallelic variants for the recessive case. And we want to understand how to apply our model across multiple genes and different contexts of the liter literature versus clinical cases. Um, our goals are ultimately to improve the precision of clinical diagnoses and rapidly identify genotype-phenotype relationships or lack thereof, and hopefully one day get this sort of achieve this objective, less biased, next-generation morbid map across the genome, um, which will facilitate understanding the distribution of phenotypic effects from gene perturbations. Um, I wanted to emphasize that we need far more individual level variant phenotype data to have the power to analyze all genes, so we're limited by what is available in our data set. Um, and we can curate cases from the literature, but that's a very manual process that's really hard to scale. Um, and they're also not representative of real world, real world, real world data. Um, and so data sharing is really critical for, for us to expand this project. That's just amazing. And as you might imagine, um, I'm incredibly excited about Dr. Chong's work because uh, it's really building upon a lot of the work that our community has um, has built over the years in terms of computational phenotyping components. Um, and so I just wanted to, to wrap up with sort of almost a, a call to action um, uh, for the future, which is um, really about how do we do better with sharing phenotypic information so that... Um, uh, investigators like Dr. Chong can really build the computational tools that we need um, to improve our diagnostic um, characterization uh, for patients and our mechanism discovery initiatives. So as you all know, standard exchange formats uh, existed for genome sequences, such as your FASTA files or VCF files, but we really didn't have a sort of comparable um, uh, exchange standard for phenotypic information. And so 
as part of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health and the Monarch Initiative, we set out to um, create a standard um, uh, called a phenopacket. Uh, next slide, please. So phenopackets um, uh, really came about when I asked my colleague if we could just, if I could just hand over um, a packet of phenotypic information in the same way that we have these, these, these exchange formats for um, genomic information. And so the idea is to really just improve the overall individual case level phenotypic descriptions um, for you know, all of the use cases that I've, I've represented before. Uh, but specifically, whether or not a phenotypic feature was observed or not, um, how the phenotypic information is linked to the patient, what about the pa parents and siblings, do they also share the same phenotypic information and associating that information with a pedigree file for trio analysis, um, how severe are the phenotypic features, um, are some more than severe than others, and when were the features first observed, and if they uh, were ameliorated at some point in response to treatment, for example. Um, how can we, um, you know, how can we sort of document all of this sort of phenotypic characterization, not dissimilar from the information that you might create for metadata for a biosample, for example, if you have a genomic information. So this is really the analogous um, standard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this is just sort of thinking about all the different ways that we could use um, case level information. And as Dr. Chong had mentioned, one of the big challenges that we have is the literature. So in the literature where we have rare disease descriptions, we might have a small cohort, um, you know, um, uh, uh, several dozen patients, and you usually see tables in those in those. Um, those journal articles that might say this many patients had this phenotypic feature and that many patients had that one, but not what each individual patient um, actually had and all the characteristics that I mentioned on the prior slide. And we really need that information for the kinds of algorithms that Dr. Chong was mentioning, as well as for our diagnostic tools to really understand um, the trajectory of phenotypic um, characters that um, uh, change over time, uh, and also the penetrance and expressivity of those features across a large swath of the world. And this is really challenging for rare diseases when the literature is really not giving us that information that we need, and we only have um, a few sources of that information coming from uh, the wonderful collaboration that Dr. Chong has with, doc with Gene DX and, and ClinVar, but there really uh, is a great need um, to exchange phenotypic information at a case level. Another use case is really thinking about when a clinic sends a lab out to a clinical lab for doing the diagnostic work, they often send out a PDF of the relevant portions of the electronic health record or a candidate diagnosis, but not, um, not necessarily phenotypic characterization of the patient that would be used in the diagnostic uh, tools like the Examizer tool that I showed you earlier. Um, and so there are many different kinds of contexts, many different um, providers of phenotypic information that um, could leverage phenopackets, um, many different data sources, um, including clinical notes, really extracting information from the notes. As we know, much of the phenotypic characters are, are documented therein or in imaging metadata and the like. Um, we need to be able to combine these data sources with things like whole genome sequences, pedigree information, mobile health data, um, and have mechanisms for ingesting this case-level phenotypic information into the EHR, into research models like OMOP um, for exchange and fire. We have a, a Vulcan accelerator project focusing on converting um, EHR data um, and exchanging it out of the EHR using fire for those clinical labs. Um, application-based entry, such as the phenotypes tool, which is very commonly utilized, wonderful tool um, uh, for capturing HPO terms for cases for rare disease patient cases, and also for sequencing and testing outputs. There are many different use cases and users that I don't need to go through anymore, but suffice it to say that our goal is to really create a whole ecosystem um, of phenotypic data exchange to support the computational needs of uh, and bringing phenot phenotypes um, up to par with uh, you know, some of the standards in the genomics um, context. Um, and um, uh, so uh, just 
you know, really excited to announce that the Phenopacket standard is on its first, second version. It's also now an approved ISO standard um, and is being used around the world. Um, and really excited to, to um, have in particular, Japan has uh, their whole biobanking system now generating Phenopackets for their biobank samples uh, and the EBI biosamples repository is also um, sharing Phenopackets now as well. And there are many other use cases um, documented in the Global Alliance for Genomics Health uh, website and on phenopackets.org. Next slide. So um, just last but not least, I just kind of wanted to talk about, you know, one of the challenges um, of, you know, doing this kind of computational phenotyping. And one of the things that Dr. Chong's work will really um, complement and synergize with is our work for public health surveillance of rare diseases um, using the electronic health record, if we had more phenotypic information uh, and better tools that we could integrate um, using the genotype phenotype uh, association data that would come out of her work, um, as well as our existing um, annotations that I mentioned earlier. And so this is a, um, some work that we did in collaboration with um, NCATS called the Ideas Initiative, where we compared um, 14 rare diseases across different electronic health record systems to look at the disease trajectory of care for those individual patients and how were the how did the care and the expenses of that care differ across health systems as well as the incidence of that rare disease in those different health systems and so this is just an example of what it looks like for an initial diagnosis of batten disease um, uh, um, at 14 years of age and you can kind of see some of the um, phenotypic characterizations, laboratories, treatments, um, hospitalizations that occur. Um, and so it's just wanted to put this in here to remind everyone that um, describing the phenotypic features of an individual patient for phenotypic um, characterization for diagnostics or for the gene disease associations in Dr. Chung's work is only the tip of the iceberg. We really need to incorporate many other characterized uh, characters of the patient's journey um, into supporting public health surveillance and diagnostic tools that might include things like, you know, um, types of, of care that are seen, um, you know, or, or um, specific treatments as part of the computable phenotypes for um, the electronic health record surveillance work. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, I think some of the takeaways that we're hoping to, you're hoping to get, we're hoping you get from this is that you know computational methods can reveal novel disease entities as well as mechanisms. We really need out more algorithms and better algorithms to aid prediction of Mendelian disease genes and the distribution of phenotypic effects. Uh -oh. um, this work would not be possible. Also, I want to emphasize without the prior investment um, from NHGRI and others in resources like HPO and Mondo and Phenopackets and the overall development of phenomics as a field. Thanks, Dr. Chong. I, I also just, um, I think we've hopefully encouraged everyone that we really, really need individual level genotype and phenotype sharing across research and clinical contexts. We need to model diseases and their attributes in the same way, regardless of the domain geography uh, around the world. And um, finally, diagnostics and, its, and translational science will be greatly aided by all of the above. And so with that, we will look forward to hearing your questions and our discussion. Okay. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, I'm Lisa Chadwick. I'm a program director in the Division of Genome Sciences at NHGRI, and I'm the program director for Gregor, so that's how I know Jessica. Um, I see that there are questions coming through in the Q&A. Don't forget to put them in there. I don't know if, I don't think you even have access to the chat, but don't put them there because we won't see them. Um, while I wait for questions to keep coming in, I'm going to ask you one of my own questions. So, um, you know, the, both of these talks really showed us how important it is to have like comprehensive phenotype information about an individual that you can mine, right? Um, but I think like we all know that there are a lot of challenges with actually getting that, right? So you're at the other end, you're still based on what a person is doing. And it's a clinician, they are busy, they're trying to put stuff in their notes, but maybe they're even a specialist. They're really only looking at one part of the phenotype and they're not capturing the whole phenotype. So how do you address that so that tools like what you talked about here can be their most successful? Maybe, and that can be for either of you. Yeah, maybe I can start 
because I think um, we probably have complementary uh, ideas and, and expertise at, at trying to address that problem. It is a really huge problem, as I mentioned the zebra phenomena, you know, you can't expect a general practitioner in a rural healthcare setting to really know, you know, what to do with an extremely rare disease that they'll likely only see once in their whole life. Um, and so we need to build better clinical decision support tools. At the same time, those clinicians are, are incredibly overburdened. Um, and so there's this tension that needs to be um, overcome, I think. Um, and so, you know, we, we really aim to develop tools that that really help clinicians in any um, clinical setting support the moving along of a, of a potential rare disease patient. That's why that public health surveillance um, activity with electronic health record data is so important because if a clinician is notified that, hey, your pa patient um, has characteristics that make them a potential candidate for further diagnostic workup for a given rare disease, then they can get moved along faster. And we, we call this... Um, very technical term, the zebra button and the electronic health record, which would basically be a way to say, hey, um, there's a there's a flag, your patient, your patient may have um, a rare condition. Here are some of the next um, labs or, or other evaluations that you might do to help determine that or otherwise um, refer them on. Um, and the, the computational phenotyping and semantic similarity algorithms can really give us that. So if um, it's very similar to Amazon, where users who shop for one thing shop for another, um, we can do the same thing with some of the phenotyping comparisons. So if a certain lab set of lab values come back um, as abnormal, they are characteristic um, of a component set of components of a known rare disease, we can say, oh, you need to do this last lab. And once you do that, you'll know if they're um, a candidate for further work up for, for a rare disease or not. So really sort of bootstrapping um, what knowledge we do have in the EHR to um, get the clinicians to request additional labs or additional information that would then help them move that patient along. So that's that's some of the work that we've been working on. And yeah. for, my, for my side, um, when, one of the things that that's why it would be really useful to have much, much more data, right? Because, you know, for example, we had about 230 cases from GeneDx, but that's just one lab. You know, if we really had all the cases around the world in one database, you know, then you can start doing things essentially like uh, imputation. So right now you can do imputation for genotypes where, you know, if one person is done on chip X and the other person is done on chip Y, you can kind of use references to kind of fill in the missing, um, uh, the missing information. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can kind of do a similar thing if you have enough data. Mm -hmm. I think I'm looking at the questions in the chat too. I think there's another one that sort of is in line with this. Uh, they mention that they often look at clinical tables and having some sort of standard for clinical tables to capture phenotypes of each patient might be helpful. Like, you know, providing some tool that is like, here's all the things that we want you to know about this thing. So make sure that you know whether these things are here or not. Um, um, another question, so there are a couple of questions that sort of relate to what you were talking about, Jessica, about predicting how many genes might be involved in phenotypes. Um, so one question is about how do you deal with the genes that at the moment have no known function in any organism, um, but they might be conserved across all organisms. Does the fact that they're conserved, is that enough to suggest that they might be important enough that they would lead to a phenotype someday? Um, also, I think you know some phenotypes are not going to be observable in every condition. So how do you really know that it's a, a never case where it has no phenotype? Maybe it just doesn't have a phenotype in that specific condition. So how do you approach that? Right. So, so the never case is that, yes, I completely agree. There's all sorts of caveats. And that's why I say never with quotes, because you can never actually say never in biology. Um, but we need to have something to say that these are the negatives. So either it could be true that every single gene might underlie a Mendelian condition. That's one way to, you know, to think about it. Or we can say that these ones are the least likely or the least easy for us to show. Um, and then for the phenotype, um, not having not having a current phenotype model organism, so that's why we actually built our model to not use any information or annotations about phenotypes in model organisms mm -hmm. because we didn't want to have that bias. Um, and so we we're trying to go like as as broad and as close to genomic level annotations as possible. Um, and so then it shouldn't it shouldn't matter that there is no phenotype for other organisms. 
Mm -hmm. So um, some of the questions are about, you know, I, I think one of them really gets to the crux of the whole topic, which is like, how do you define a single disease and distinguish that from another disease? I think I would also put, put in the same category, the concept of a phenotype expansion. Like, how do you know what's a phenotype expansion? And you might want to define that for the audience um, versus a totally different um, phenotype. How do you approach that? Right. So, so phenotype expansion, if what, for the audience is, you know, this idea that, um, you know, everyone accepts that this condition, whatever this disease entity is, is described by blah, 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 phenotypes or clinical findings. And then now someone finds some individual that has a very distinct, different um, additional finding, for example. So then you're, we can say that that is expanding what is known about the phenotype due to mutations in this gene. Um, and it actually can also be the absence of the phenotype. That's a, so it would technically be a phenotype contraction, but everyone's kind of using expansion to kind of as an umbrella for both of those. Mm -hmm. um, so from what we're trying to do, um, yes, the we're hoping that what we want to do is say like, there's all different ways for clinicians to manually define what is considered to be one disease and then this is another distinct disease. And so we're saying, can we not do that and just give it to the computer with mm -hmm. a model and do it in sort of this agnostic way? And what do we get out? Um, and so it's not saying that this is necessarily always the right answer or the one that every clinician will agree with. Um, but if we use the same model and same criteria across every single gene, how many different conditions and what conditions are we going to get out? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, one, you know, one of the things I do want to go back to, you know, what the ClinGen um, you know, collaboration is around the lumping and splitting. So one of the considerations, though, from a clinical perspective is that, you know, you may have phenotype expansion, um, you know, in, in one patient compared to a, a standard definition or compared to another patient. But fundamentally, when it involves different clinical decision making, um, there's a good reason to computationally define it as a separate entity because then our tools can better support the clinical decision making um, activity for the next um, time a patient with that rare disease com comes in, right? So it's really important that we combine these sort of clinical needs and, and sort of um, you know, granular uh, curation approaches um, with that mind, with that goal in mind, together with these computational approaches. Because at the end of the day, the best way to make sure this can get delivered to clinical care is to make sure that the decision making process is as as easy and accurate as as possible. And when those differences exist, it's really important that they're they're made front and center. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question got at one of the other things that complicates this whole process. So you've got uh, phenotypes, and you're trying to figure out what phenotypes are associated with what um, with what gene, what with what disease. Um, but there are also many times where an individual might have two different um, genes that are actually contributing to that phenotype. How do you how do you work that into this whole model? <laughs> We have not gotten that far yet. I'll be very honest. Actually, even we're right now trying to, we're going to, right, the next thing we're working on is trying to figure out how to handle the receptive case, which would be mm -hmm. two, two different variants in the same gene. Um, it would be easy if we had 10, a thousand cases for every gene, um, because then you can, you can expect to see many different combinations of two different variants. Um, but without that, uh, we haven't really figured that out yet. It might we end up being that we group by the type of mutation or something like that. And so digenic um, is a whole nother ball game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there has been some nice work, though, um, which I think will be a great uh, input to Dr. Chong's um, uh, future work. Uh, using just the phenotype similarity alone to disentangle multiple molecular lesions um, uh, in the same patient or in the same pedigree. So um, I think it's a really wonderful idea and that, that you know, and again, that kind of gets after like this tension between what's the phenotype expansion or just variability of phenotypic features in a single um, molecular lesion versus, you know, how do those um, phenotypic features um, differ and interact um, when you have multiple molecular lesions. Mm -hmm. 
So um, another question that I had was, you know, another kind of phenotypic data that a researcher might be generating from a patient sample is more of a molecular phenotype data. So how do you incorporate um, molecular phenotypes into this overall framework of defining a disease and, uh, and associating with a, gene, uh, with a gene? I'd say for us, we will rely on this being built into an ontology. Um, so that can be, Melissa can answer that part. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think we um, we have sort of, in a sort of very early way, I should say it's very, it's very early efforts, tried to do that. So if you, if you look, we have a, we have a collaboration with the LOINC um, project, which has a lot, which is the ontology for laboratory measurements to create interoperability with the human phenotype ontology. And some of those cases might, might have things like, you know, if there's an expression assay outcome, um, that that could be then coded with a LOINC um, value that can then be um, converted into a human phenotype ontology term. Um, so that's one, one approach. Um, fundamentally, though, I think we need to do better to think about specific diagnostic um, omics signatures that are associated with their individual disease entities. So for example, if, you know, maybe the indication of the future might be that for a given disease, you should run an expression analysis um, and examine, you know, um, uh, comparisons uh, for a specific set of, of biomarkers in a specific tissue for certain age groups, right? So these are sort of like the diagnostic um, guidelines that that information really needs to be associated then with these same disease entities. Um, it can sort of have, you know, signatures in the um, ontology as well as sort of like, you know, um, expression comparison between X and Y, you know, is high in such and such tissue. Um, we can certainly encode that in the human phenotype ontology, but I think fundamentally there's going to be, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of these types of specific, um, you know, multi-omics approaches that are associated with individual um, diagnostic areas that we need to really come up with a strategy for associating those indications um, with individual disease entities. And we have not figured out how to do that yet. Well, good. You guys have a lot of work to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question I see in the chat is about the genes that you defined as sort of future discovery genes, Jessica. How do you think that we could think about this in terms of medical genetics? So if you see a patient, you don't have anything that's associated with something that is already a known gene phenotype association, but you have a VUS maybe in one of these genes that is predicted to probably be involved. How can we take advantage of that kind of information to help inform, you know, variant prioritization and interpretation? Yeah. Oh gosh, I really hope so. That would be like the dream, right? Um, so I think right now, at least on the gene discovery side, right, right, we if we see if we have a case and they have an individual with a you know protein truncating variant like a frame shift in a gene, and we look up the gene and they are like you know highly constrained for a loss of function variation, so you don't see you know nearly the variation you loss of function variance you expect to see. Um, people already are saying like, okay, that's a that's a hot hot hit, right? That's a hot mm -hmm. panic. Um, and so, you know, what we hope would be that you can do this for all genes. So not just the loss of function mechanism, but everything and say, and, and be able to say like, yeah, this patient, this is a, it's a hot goose. Um, we've been talking about this a bit in, um, in the, the Gregor consortium about, uh, you know, what, what criteria could be used to define levels of gooses essentially. Yes, yeah, my favorite classification of a VUS is the ice cold VUS, which <laughs> really <laughs> makes me think of ice, ice baby. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's uh, interesting. So I, I also see another interesting question here. So we talked about earlier about the challenges associated with even gathering this phenotype information from clinicians. Um, but of course, patients and their families are really invested in this as well. So how can patients help in uh, contributing phenotype information that's going to help define uh, what their phenotype really is? So I'll say that um, um, we have... Um, Six years ago, seven, eight years ago now, we we actually got an open science prize from NIH to develop a website that we call MyGene2 that's actually meant for families, well, it's supposed to be family-friendly and patient-friendly to essentially 
create profiles saying, you know, here's my, you know, here are my symptoms and here's my variant if I, if they have one um, mm. a variant of interest. And then we actually use some of these you know, HPO um, tools to extract and recognize the HPO terms from whatever family types in. So they don't need to know the technical terms. It can kind of hope magically recognize it from their data and then, um, and make that information available publicly. Um, and I think that's something that families can do is share their information. Um, I think a lot of families seem to be, they're, they're very busy. Obviously, if they have a kid who's affected, they're, you know, maybe even overwhelmed. Right. But I can't emphasize enough that families have information that even the clinicians don't have because they're living it every single day. Right. Um, and if that information right now, the standard of the field is that either they're the only ones who know, or it's in a you know, as maybe there's specific disease groups registry that is pretty much un closed access to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. and if it's closed access, I, I think I'm a firm believer in open data sharing. If it's closed access, no one else ha knows about it. We don't know it exists. We can't use it. Right. Um, so it really needs to be public for it to be used. Yeah, and of course, as you know, and, and Gregor, we're thinking a lot about how we can share these data the most openly as we can, because you're exactly right. That's the real key to understanding these phenotypes is finding other people who have the same kind of phenotype and using that information all together. And I also know that a lot of our programs have um, patient-driven sort of ways that they can even register to be part of the project. So I think there is a are a lot of places where the patients and their families can help participate in this process. Melissa, you said you were going to answer this, and then I think we'll uh, wrap this up. Wonderful. Yeah, I just um, wanted to mention also that um, we've been able to translate the human phenotype ontology into what we call laypersonese. Uh, for use by patients directly and create, we have a project that was funded by PCORI that we're just about to um, push out. Uh, so it'll be a manuscript um, any day now or preprint where we basically created synthetic profiles for all of our rare disease gold standard annotations using, um, uh, using only the layperson terms and then looked at the diagnostic efficacy of those uh, if patients were to provide those terms. And it turns out that that patients provide information that is often missed, as as Dr. Chang, Chang said, um, uh, that you know is often missed in a clinical setting. So, for example, if a baby is inconsolable or someone snores, these are not things that are clinically evaluated. You know, at you know right. at, at the time. So, we we actually know that it's incredibly important to have computational representation of the patient's features from the patients and families put together with the clinical evaluation, and that's going to be maximally diagnostic um, uh, if, and, and it really should be a collaboration anyway. So we're, we're really excited to help build tools uh, for pa the patient community. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of the terms that you had up on your slide earlier were things that I would have had to Google. So I would have had a hard time reporting to you if I had any of those phenotypes. So uh, I think that brings us to the end of this seminar. I want to really thank both of our speakers, Jessica Chong and Melissa Handel. This was a great talk. We really enjoyed it. Um, I know that this will also be available online. If you'd like to watch it again, you can. Um, and uh, Melissa and Jessica also noted that their slides are gonna be available at a bit.ly link. And if you watch it again, they said what the link was. It's probably in the chat as well. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so uh, I hope that you'll take advantage of that. But uh, otherwise, thank you all for joining us and we hope we'll see you at the next Genomic Innovator Seminar. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs>